Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Gray Review, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 8th of March, 2022. Alright everyone, let's get into it. So, we have a new Merge update today. So, Parathos here put out a tweet saying, After four days of proof of work, Merge DevNet 5, which I mentioned the other day, hit TTD today. The chain continued finalizing post-TTD as expected. This means uh, the Merge was successful. We ran a few zombie miners. Miners ran older versions that don't know about TTD and just continued mining post TTD no issues were found and then he continues by saying we should be releasing information about the kill and test net in the next few days so this is a big deal because um as I mentioned before, this kind of like DevNet was uh, was to happen before the next kind of like test net was to be spun up, which is Killen, which is hopefully going to be the last test net. Uh, and if all goes well with the, with the Killen test net, then uh, we, we will have a kind of like mainnet window, I would say, uh, which is super exciting, right? I mean, the hilarious thing is, is that so many people talked about the merge for, for you know, the last few months and then the market went quiet and we had just way less people in the ecosystem and then people went quiet about it. Um, but, you know, obviously I've been talking about it every other day. I've been talking talking about the effects it's going to have, everything that's coming down the pipeline with regards to it and keeping you guys updated because there's still, I mean, as I've said, I've said this plenty of times, I'm not going to repeat myself again, again go, go into it too much again, but there is still all this work happening in the background, whether you're paying attention or not. So very, very cool to see that there were no issues found on the DevNet 5. And as I said, if there are no issues found on the Killen testnet, then we're going to have a mainnet window, which, um, you know, as I've mentioned plenty of times, June uh, is kind of like the target, could happen in July, but if it happens and then that's just absolutely massive right that's a huge kind of like vote of confidence for ethereum's ability to ship and ship major upgrades without with kind of like no issues attached to them uh you know not to mention all the downstream effects from that so very very excited for all of that uh and yeah keep an eye out or keep an ear out for the kill and test net details which i will be covering once they're released in the next few days all right, so some news out of Bloomberg today uh, that says President Joe Biden is set to sign an executive order this week that will outline the U.S. government's strategy for cryptocurrencies. Now, for those who don't know, this has been in the works for quite a while. This is not an overnight thing. This is not a thing that's in kind of like... um in response to the stuff happening in, in Russia and, and Ukraine and the sanctions and all that sort of stuff. This, I remember hearing about this a while ago, but it seems uh, the Biden administration is ready to sign uh, and this executive, or at least Joe is ready to sign this exec executive order. Uh, and I think this can be a good thing. People expect this to be a bad thing. They think crypto is going to get so heavily regulated and it's going to be really, really shitty. And, it, and you know, everyone's going to kind of like lose their, lose their money because <laughs> crypto is going to dump. I don't think that's the case, guys. I think what's going to happen is that this should give us more regulatory clarity, which will actually be better for the bigger players in the ecosystem and give them more clarity and make it just clearer about what can and can't be done, especially within the US where... Obviously, a lot of, especially DeFi teams based in the US are really scared of regulators. So scared, in fact, that they won't even airdrop tokens to US citizens anymore, which is just crazy, right? So if this executive order can uh, can, can can basically reverse that trend and make it so that US people are treated uh, the same as kind of like anyone else or the same as most people, obviously, there are still a lot of countries excluded from things due to sanctions anyway. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, like North Korea, Korea and Russia and all that sort of stuff. But... U.S. is normally lumped in with those kind of uh, with, with those types of countries, and it's just crazy. Whenever I see the list of ba of banned countries from things, and it lists the United States and North Korea, I'm just like, <laughs> what the hell? And like, obviously, there's a bunch of Middle Eastern countries in there as well. Um, and I just think, you know, this is just very, very weird. Um, not, not obviously, not trying to get political here, but obvi obviously, the U.S. is really, as far as I know, the only uh, first world developed nation, especially the only kind of like developed superpower that that suffers from these sorts of things, especially for their own citizens like there are teams in the u.s doing tokens and aren't airdropping the token to their u.s users or investors or anything like that which is which is obviously very very crazy so i'm looking forward to to seeing what this is as I said, I think it's going to be a positive. I don't think it's going to be a negative. We have a lot of people in our kind of like uh, court here, especially in the arena of, of the political arena. Because if you think about it, think about all the US-based funds, the billion-dollar funds that have massive skin in the game to make sure that this industry doesn't become overregulated. There's, you know, there's not bad regulations put in place. But not just that, there are you know think tanks like Coin Center that do a lot of great work and they have the funding to do that as well. They, they've been given a lot of money recently, which is cool to see. There's a bunch of others out there i mean money, there's no kind of like shortfall of money here 
and people in crypto are getting more involved with with politics as well so as i said i think this is going to be a positive i don't foresee this being a negative but we're going to have to see how it shakes out maybe it happens uh this week as they said maybe it doesn't happen until next week obviously um you know uh biden has a lot more on his mind than this sort of stuff but we'll see if it happens this week all the better all right, so Immutable has announced an absolutely massive raise of $200 million in, seri in a Series C funding round, uh, which values Immutable at a $2.5 billion valuation here. Now, this is big for multiple reasons, obviously, but I wanna just disclose here that I am an investor in Immutable. I didn't invest in this round, but I invested in their Series A round, which was a little while ago now. Um, but yeah, just a d disclaimer there. So obviously, <laughs> obviously I have some skin in the game. But essentially, uh, why this? I think this is a big deal. Well, firstly, it's another layer two scalability project for Ethereum getting massive funding. You know, always a good thing. Uh, secondly, it's a uh, uh, it's got a bunch of investors that haven't actually invested in crypto before, such as Tencent. As far as I know, Tencent hasn't invested in crypto before, especially not in the kind of like NFT gaming area, which is huge because Tencent is an absolutely massive company. They ha they're massive in the video game industry, and they're doing a lot of um. A lot of investments there, but they're kind of like making their way into crypto now. Uh, and there's a bunch of kind of like other investors here. These are the typical investors you'll see in these later rounds, like the Series B, Series C, Series D sort of thing, because they have you know a lot, a lot of money, um, and they're not they don't they're not they don't they're not the funds that kind of like take the early risk, or at least majority of their funds don't take the early risk of the seed and the Series A's and stuff like that. Um, but then you can see some other investors here, like Al Alameda Research, which was disappointing to see. As you guys know, Alameda is uh, is FTX's thing, uh, and they're big on the Solana ecosystem. So it, it's always bizarre to me that they, one, invest in layer twos on Ethereum when they're all in on, on Solana, and um, and two, the, the fact that these kind of like uh, teams kind of like give them the allocation. And, you know, it could happen for any reason out there. I don't think it's like bearish for Immutable that they got money from Alameda, just like I don't think it's bearish for Starkware. But uh, yeah, it's just kind of like the way it is at, 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 at these kind of like levels here. But Anyway, very, very cool to see this. Obviously, Immutable is you know kicking tons of goals. They're, they're scaling NFTs. They're doing a lot of great stuff there. Um, I know people have been kind of like complaining about the token price. <laughs> I can't comment on that as I have obviously a direct conflict of interest there. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, you know, just checking out the pricing that it's kind of like been down only for a while is unfortunate. Um, but I think that's just the sign of both, the, you know, the kind of like the market in general. And, uh, and the fact that it's a riskier investment, right, end of the day. But uh, as I said, I'm not going to go into detail on that due to my conflicts, conflicts of interest there. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to kind of like discuss about uh, this, not particularly the raise, but just like immutable in general, is that when I look at kind of teams and projects in crypto, I look at the ones that have been like, and kind of like rank them and, and, and look at them and, and kind of like uh, try to figure out which ones are, you know, long-term kind of like sustainable, going to be around long-term, going to be around no matter if it's bear or bull market. And, you know, Immutable is one of those companies, one of those projects, because if you track Immutable's history back, they've been around for quite a while now, um, you know, four, four ish years, I think probably or maybe more than that. Um, and they've been building all that time and they haven't given up on their projects. They're still building Gods Unchained, which has been, you know, they're, they're basically their earliest project. They've been building uh, Immutable, for, Immutable X for quite a while now. They're obviously raising large funding rounds to keep doing that. They're hiring like crazy. They're onboarding a lot of the traditional gaming space uh, into the NFT ecosystem. And they're doing this through, as I said, bull or bear. And that's what I look at. And, you know, at the, at, the other, at the kind of like other side of things though, there is that there are projects out there who kind of seem to like feign as if they're build, still building or they're kind of like faking it. And this is true for a lot of the 2017 era projects that their projects are dead. They're zombie projects. They're completely failed. They, they found no product market fit. It's better just to kind of like kill them off and stop wasting your time. But obviously, given that they have tokens, there's a bit of conflicting uh, things there. Maybe they feel an obligation to token holders to drive value back to the token, or maybe they don't. They don't want to kind of like um, have regulators after them if they basically say, "Oh, well, it failed, and uh, you know our project's over," and then and then kind of like the token goes to zero, uh, and then everyone just kind of like blames them and, and you know sends lawsuits their way and things like that. There, there are obviously a multitude of reasons here, but don't mistake projects building for a while as being a good project. Like my point is that, you know, there are projects that have been building for a while that are seeing lots of success, but there are also a lot of projects that have been building since 2017 or even 2016 or earlier that are complete and, you know, objective failures. And they really should just like, you know, stop beating the dead horse and, and stop. But 
A lot of them don't for, for the variety of reasons. Some of them I just outlined there. But anyway, absolutely massive raise from Immutable. Congrats to them on this. Curious to see what they do with this money and who else they onboard into the crypto ecosystem. Um, and speaking of, I guess, like funding rounds for layer twos, Polina had an interesting tweet uh, today where they said, just two StarkX application specific volitions have now raised close to $1 billion. Makes you question narratives from the alt L1 mania a few months ago. Smart contract chains devour application specific chains. VCs will only fund alt L1s and L1s are most valuable. Uh, FPT. Uh, and then Polina goes on to say in another tweet, in reality, app-specific roll-ups evolutions are far and away the most efficient solutions. Not all applications, uh, scenarios, and users require synchronicity like DeFi. VCs will throw money at the kitchen sink. <laughs> applications accrue most value, exception monetary premium. I've been banging on about this stuff for a while. For you know, you regular refuel listeners out there, you will know exactly uh, the, uh, exactly what I mean. But I want to address each of these points, uh, just like specifically here, because I think it's interesting. So there is a lot of, I guess, or was a lot of belief that smart contract chains would make app specific chains completely obsolete and it wouldn't make any sense. And then people would argue and say, well, no, that's not going to happen. You know, we have Cosmos, we have Polkadot, they're doing app specific chains, it's going to be good. But my thesis was that app specific chains need to be done at layer two. I don't think that it makes sense for an app to have to worry about its own sovereignty. And by that, I mean spinning up its own validator set because it is wildly inefficient, it is hard, and it takes focus away from actually just building the app at the end of the day. So that's why I've always been bearish on the Cosmos and Polkadot models and really bullish on the Ethereum plus L2 model. Even if those L2s aren't generalized, they're just as specific. Obviously, DYDX and Immutable are kind of like proving that out. And there are going to be other projects out there as well that prove that out. I mean, Loop, Ring, Diversify, they're all proving it out uh, that the model works. Uh, and then Polina says, VCs will only fund alt l ones There's another narrative out there. Of course, they're not only going to fund alt l ones guys. They have billions of dollars. They've got to throw it at the kitchen sink, as Polina said. But also, I think a lot of these VCs sees they i mean the way they operate is that they obviously have to spread out their bets right they can't just like go all in on one investment and that's it because that's just not how a vc firm operates and that's just not how vc works generally um so they're spreading their bets out but i there are some vcs out there that get it right they don't just kind of like do the spray and pray approach they actually get that the modular approach to scalability especially when it's within ethereum and its layer two ecosystem is obviously very very healthy and then point us third point that L1s will be the most value, valuable or are the most valuable. I've talked about this plenty of times on the review. I think that there are very, very few L1 tokens that are going to be valuable long term. ETH, obviously. Um, BTC, I mean, you could argue. I, no, I personally don't think BTC is going to be super valuable long term, especially once ETH flips it. But you could argue that it, um, it's obviously going to be val more valuable than most of the other kind of like layer one chains out there. But... I, I, yeah, I, I just don't think long term a lot of these L1 tokens are going to hold their value, especially not against ETH, because at the end of the day, ETH has natural demand, ETH has natural use cases, ETH is a amazing asset. It, uh, you know, and, and ETH is kind of like a shelling point for the ecosystem, um, especially on the smart contract side. So, so yeah, I mean, the thing is, there are a lot of these, uh, I guess, VCs and funds. They're able to get in on these L1 tokens really early on, and you can obviously make a lot of money. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, early investors on Avalanche and and Terra and Solana made a lot, but at the same time, those were available at public markets too, and you could have you could have made a lot there too. But it's it's all well and good to make a lot, but like a lot of what a lot of people end up doing is that they'll make the money, but then they'll just keep holding. They won't actually take profits, and then over time, these things just kind of like bleed out, especially during bear markets. I mean, you go look at some of these charts. I believe Solana is down seventy percent from its all time high. AVAX is down fifty percent. Um, Terra Terra is uh, faring a, a bit better, but uh, I think that's just because they raised money recently. So I'm not sure what's going to happen there. And as I've said before to you guys, I don't view Terra as similar to Ethereum, really. They're, they're doing kind of like one thing, um, or at least one ecosystem of things, which is centered around their, their stablecoin, obviously. But you go and look at the others, like Phantom, for example, that's just completely destroyed, especially against ETH. Um, and all these other ones, like uh, kind of like Nia, Adam, they're all just kind of like bleeding out because the the market doesn't can't sustain that many. And, and, and people are just aren't interested in holding those sorts of things, especially because they know that there's not natural demand for them. They're just narrative trades. So, so yeah, I totally agree with Polino here that 
the narrative of L1s being the most valuable is not true for like most L1s out there. Um, and, and as Polino says, except for the ones with a monetary premium, which is exactly what ETH and BTC have at, in, at current time, I am not convinced there'll be any other smart contract platforms that will be able to uh, accrue monetary premium for their native asset. I think that there's only going to be one or two and you know, there currently are only is two. Maybe there is only one in the future, but you know, two, two I think will, will sustain for a while, but I don't view any of these other ones being able to kind of like get up to that, uh, that level basically. All right, so I guess I think the rest of the refill is going to be about layer twos, guys. So, so a bunch of exciting layer two news today. Uh, first, out of Argent. Uh, so now their layer two uh, kind of like account and features is available to everyone, no longer in beta. So as they say here, you've got low gas fees, super fast speeds, trade stake and earn, bulletproof security, and 100 times less carbon emissions, which I, I like. I like the fact that the, the um, kind of like teams working with layer twos are actually talking about this because of the fact that you know, a lot of people are concerned about the environmental impact of uh, of crypto, which is fair enough. So let's kind of like harp on about that and be like, look, uh, these layer twos are obviously um, much more efficient because uh, they are not running proof of work. And then obviously post-merge Ethereum is going to be in that arena as well. But but anyway, if you uh, have Argent and if you kind of like been waiting to have Argent, or I guess like to um, to play around with Argent, now's the time to do so because you can do it using a layer two account. No need to use layer one Ethereum. No need to use the high fees. Uh, I mean, even at 20 way, like the fees are relatively cheap compared to what they've been, but that's still too high. I mean, a swap is what? Still like $10, I think. Uh, you know, if I'm doing my math correctly in my head. That's still way too much, right? So get on the L2s. Get on the L2s now, guys, because it's cheap to bridge in. Uh, it, it's never been a, per a, a more perfect time, I think. Uh, but yeah, uh, good to see Argent come out of beta here with their L2 integration. All right, so Arbitrum announced today that they have released research.arbitrum.io, which is a forum for Arbitrum research, development, and ideas for improvements. Now, obviously, it's quite bare right now because it was just launched, but this is kind of similar to the ETH research forum. For those of you who have seen that, basically, uses the same kind of like uh, website templates. Um, and this is all about Arbitrum, uh, you know, a, a, as an ecosystem. And there are a couple of open topics that Arbitrum wants to tackle, such as compression in Nitro, which has obviously got to do with the coming, uh, uh, doing gas fees um, and core data compression and getting those gas fees down in their Nitro upgrade, L2 compute gas of pricing and support for BLS signatures in Nitro. So you can go here and actually look at these threads, like there's an L2 compute gas pricing here. Uh, there's a discussion here. I mean, Ed Felton has started it, which is one of the founders of Offchain Labs who builds Arbitrum. Uh, and then you have like a bunch of others here. So obviously, as I said, pretty bare right now, but I expect this to kind of like heat up over time. I'm very excited to see an open research forum for a layer two. That's definitely, uh, you know, a, a welcome thing to see in the ecosystem. And I think that this is just the first step towards decentralizing these things because Changes to the protocol should be done out in the open. Um, it shouldn't just be up to the off-chain labs core team for these L2s going for, uh, and just L2s in general shouldn't be up to the core team. And this is how you get to that point. This is how you get to the point where you decentralize over time, not just with a token, but creating a culture of uh, open building, open development, and, and, and publicly at that. So very cool to see this. I'll link it in the YouTube description for you to check out. All right, so Lee.File uh, or LeFi Protocol here today have announced that they've built a cross-chain dApp that allows you to donate any token from any EVM chains to the Ukraine cause. So you, you no longer have to worry about the ETH gas fees. You can donate any amount and every dollar counts. So if you want to do this, you can go to transfer2.xyz slash Ukraine uh, and kind of like donate there. You know, look, the reason I, I kind of like bring this up is because I wanted to kind of talk about how I really like how the crypto community has come together really quickly to to do this for for not you know for Ukraine obviously but just in general. I think people underestimate not underestimate people forget why this industry was kind of like founded or what the the principles that this industry was kind of like founded on with Bitcoin, then with Ethereum and then with kind of like um you know other things out there. One of the major principles is helping those who have been either kind of, I guess, like uh, oppressed or uh, suffering from, from, you know, war or kicked off the traditional financial system or, you know, sanctioned or kind of like banned from using the existing kind of like um, monetary instru instruments, all that sort of stuff. Those are kind of like the things that this industry is built on, right? Um, and on top of that, getting money to where it needs to be really quickly is another core principle that isn't talked about enough. And, you know, I know it's because we're all used to it by now, but the fact that we can send value instantaneously around the world um, with relatively kind of like cheap fees, especially at, at layer twos, 
is um, is amazing. I think it's it's truly amazing. I think it's the most underrated aspect of this industry, and I think that uh, as, uh, you know, we, it, it just kind of like shines when we kind of see like stuff like this, where Ukraine can accept donations and get instant money without any government in the middle, without any like or, uh, without any other government. Obviously, the Ukraine government is is <laughs> is a recipient here, but without any kind of like other government in the middle, and without them having to kind of like spin up any complicated infrastructure or get permission or anything like that, uh, which I think is obviously a, a, a vastly underestimated benefit. Of, of Ethereum and just, you know, blockchain and crypto in, in general there. So if you would like to donate, this is just another option for you to do so. So I'll link this in the YouTube description for you to check out. All right, so Starkware announced uh, today or yesterday that they have uh, kind of formed a strategic partnership with Alchemy, which reflects the shared commitment of their teams to build Starknet and provide developers with the full suite of Alchemy's proprietary platform infrastructure products and services. Now, I've talked about Alchemy recently uh, when I was talking about the Infura drama from the other day. Uh, they provide infrastructure for Ethereum, for I think other chains out there and also for L2. So this is just kind of like formalizing a strategic partnership between Starkware and Alchemy, which is which is really really cool. Um at the same time, you know, these centralized services are all well and good. It's all it's all totally cool and everything, but like I I want to see more of these decentralized infrastructure providers spin up. I know about Pocket Network and I think maybe there's one or two others that I'm just not um, not remembering the name of right now. But really, at the end of the day, this is like a massive thing. Uh, as I mentioned last time when I spoke about this, if all we have is like centralized infrastructure providers on top of these decentralized chains, it kind of defeats the purpose. So we definitely need to do more work, more work there. And I'm hoping Starkware maybe can... Um, can help Alchemy with this. There's no reason Alchemy can't decentralize out or create like a decentralized version of their of their product offering. Maybe maybe they don't want to because they make a lot of money from from their centralized offering. But I don't know. I feel like there is something there that can be done, and maybe Starkware can help them with that. But cool to see this, uh, I guess, formalized strategic partnership from them. Um, on to the next update. So Connext have rebranded their X Pollinate service to Connext Bridge to consolidate their brand ident identity and to make it simpler for end users to use the network. I'm glad this was done because whenever I was talking about Connects with people, I would say, oh yeah, you have to you use X Pollinate. And they're like, what's X Pollinate? You were just telling me about telling me about Connects. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, yeah, it's Connects, but like it's just a different name. You know, it, branding is extremely important, guys. Like, I think this is an this is kind of something that people don't realize is, they, especially if you're deep into crypto, branding is is everything. And if you kind of like confuse users with your brand, they get upset, they get frustrated, they get very very um, lost very very quickly. Um, so I'm very very glad to see this, and I just wanted to kind of like give a heads up to you guys because if you see Connect Bridge from now on, that is basically what X Pollinate has been, just with the new name. And the name is just simple, right? Connects the brand and bridge. It just describes what it is straight away. No need for users to get confused, which is obviously what we want to see here. Um, and then they have a little thread here, just kind of going through the context around this. But obviously, a very very good decision from Connect here. All right, finally in the L2 news, Diversify have launched a bridge to Arbitrum. Uh, so you can move your assets f between Arbitrum and Diversify without ever touching layer one, which means no delays and no hefty gas fees. This is really cool because for those of you who don't know, Diversify is a Validium built using StarQuest technology. And now they have a bridge between them and Arbitrum, which is obviously a totally different network being an optimistic rollup. So not only a different network, but a totally different architecture as well, which is absolutely awesome to see. So they, as I said, guys, these bridges, they're going to keep coming. There's going to be bridges between app specific L L2s and other ecosystems and generalized bridges and blah, blah, all this sort of stuff. You won't have to worry about moving between these things for really any uh, very much longer. And this was actually a drawback people kind of like stated about L2s. They're like, oh, there's going to be so many L2s and they're all going to be fragmented and liquidity is going to be fragmented. Interoperability is going to be hard, blah, blah, blah. And I always used to say to them like, no, there's going to be bridges. There's going to be plenty of these bridges. Yes, there's going to be an extra risk um, using these bridges, but... Over time, that risk will get le get get, um, get less, but we weren't even talking about risk. We we're just talking about the other factors. And they were like, oh, you know, that's going to be too complex for people. People aren't going to use those bridges. It's like, well, they are, and <laughs> they're using them a lot. People, you know, there's billions of dollars in these bridges for better or worse. So I think that the more of these that come online, especially, um, you know, tapping into to Lee dot Finance, which I just spoke about, which is actually a bridge aggregator, you know, it's just going to be seamless. And then wallets are going to integrate with it. They're just going to have one button you click. Everything's going to happen in the background. It's going to be totally seamless. And I, I think people who don't realize that it's going to be seamless in the future are just completely missing the forest for the trees. So I think kind of like when you can, can kind of consider all of that and you take it all into account, 
these problems are just kind of like fading away. They, they aren't even problems. They, they never were problems. But I, I'm glad to see that narratives shift, narratives change based on the you know in, you know the current information and the developments and and products and services that kind of like get released. All right, finally here, we have uh, something that I just wanted to give a quick shout out to. So there is going to be a Bankless Ethereum Down Under panel happening on March 21st at 3 p.m. PST, 5 p.m. EST, and 9 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. So this is going to be a, a kind of like Ethereum panel with Kane from Synthetics, uh, Robbie Ferguson from Immutable, Pat McNabb from Mycelium and Tracer Dow, and Sid Powell from Maple Finance all-star lineup, right, guys? And these are all Australian-based teams. That's why I'm promoting this. Obviously, you guys know I'm Australian. Uh, and I'm actually going to be attending, uh, as I said, the um, the kind of like events in real life. So I'm actually going to be in Sydney on, on the 22nd of, uh, of March here, uh, Australian time. Uh, and I'm going to be getting up at 9 a.m. <laughs> For those of you who listen to The Refuel long enough, you know that my usual wake-up time is like 11 a.m. <laughs> I never really get up at night because I am I stay up late because I got, I, I'm actually record, I record The Refuel at like... 11 p.m. my time, and then I, by the time I put it out and everything go to bed, it's like 2 a.m. So, um, yeah, yeah, like getting up at 9 a.m. or even before 9 a.m. is going to be a struggle, but I'll do it for Ethereum, guys. But <laughs> anyway, enough about my sleeping patterns. Um, what I wanted to say as well is that uh, I know, uh, you know, I, I spoke about kind of like the blockchain week yesterday and how there was real life events and virtual events and everything like that. I, and as I mentioned, like I think it was last week about the e, kind of like ETH down under event happening in December. I'm super excited about all of this because we need more stuff happening in Australia. I know I promised the Daily Gray meetup in Melbourne sometime. That's still going to happen eventually, guys. I just don't know when. I am trying to find time. I am so, so busy right now. You know, it's funny. Um, Kobe is in is in Melbourne right now and he's been trying to kind of like meet up with me. And I'm like, dude, I'm so busy. I'm sorry. I'm just crazy, like doing stuff around the house and everything like that. And you'll probably hear my dog barking. He's annoying the shit out of me lately <laughs> I've, had to, I've had to try oh man it's just it's just a bit of a disaster with, with him lately but he's all right he's healthy and everything but um anyway enough about my life story here my point is is that i hope to see much more of these australian based things happening this year i really want to obviously do the daily way meetup and if you know of any other meetups or any other things happening in australia especially in, in melbourne obviously where i live please let me know i would love to uh, love to attend love to kind of like even speak at Love to meet people there uh, and everything like that. But anyway, I think on that note, I'm going to finish it there for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.